title is the apple of his eye. I think you've all heard that expression. Speaking of a child who was loved by a parent, and you speak of the child as the apple of his father's eye. He worships him. He loves him. He can do no wrong. Well, this is really from the Bible. You can read it in the 32nd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, or the second of Zechariah. And God found Jacob in a desert, in a howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him and kept him as the apple of his eye. Apple of the eye means the pupil of the eye. A very precious thing indeed. But the word apple means literally the little man. Referring to the reflected image of the one who beholds himself in the eye of the other. So he found him and kept him as the apple of his eye. Then God could see what God looked like. When the eye was formed, he could look right into the eye and see his own image and decide to let us make man in our image. So we are told, how can this little Jacob stand? He is so small. As told us in the book of Amos. How can he stand? He is so small. Look into the eye of anyone. And you see not the one, but you see yourself reflected. And if you smile, it smiles. If you're angry, it is angry. You can't see the other. You see only yourself. So here we have in this simple little statement, God's plan, his wonderful power to create his image now, because he has to know what he looks like before he can create it. And so he sees now his image reflected in the eye of a seeming eye. So he found Jacob, where did he find him? Found him in a desert, in a howling waste of the wilderness. And then he encircled him, and he cared for him, and he kept him as the apple of his eye. And then he starts to work on this image, to endow it with life as God himself has life to endow it with a creative power, not just an animated form, but to actually give to it all that God, the creator of it, possesses. And that is our story concerning this grand mystery. In this 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, there is this beautiful imagery. And may I tell you, it is all true. It seems strange. The rock his work is perfect. The rock, and now it becomes a person, his work is perfect. And we are unmindful of the rock that we got us. And we have forgotten the God who gave us birth. So he equates the rock with God. The rock's work is perfect. And all through that 32nd chapter, the word rock is referred to. And you might think, why? Why is this imagery? It doesn't make sense. Well, let me share with you an experience that happened to me 30 odd years ago, back in the 30s. Sitting in the silence, not thinking of anything in particular, just meditating, with my eyes closed against the outer world, and my attention turned inwardly. And suddenly all the dark convolutions of the brain grew luminous, as they do 
They become numerous, golden liquid light. And you simply bask in what you behold. It's fun. And suddenly, a huge quartz, this enormous quartz, appeared around. As I looked at it, it became fragmented, shattered into numberless pieces. And just as quickly, it was reassembled, but not into the rock, reassembled into the human form, sitting in a lotus posture, in deep, deep meditation. As I looked at it, I saw it was myself. I am looking at myself in a profound meditation. And I completely lost myself in this contemplation. And it glowed and glowed and glowed. And it reached the intensity of the sun. And then it exploded. And I returned to this level of awareness. So here the imagery is true. The rock, his work, is perfect. Why the rock? Because it came in vision. Why have I forgotten? Why am I unmindful of the rock that begot me? And I have forgotten the God who gave me birth. But what is it all about? It's self-beginning. God achieves his limitless desires by a self-limitation. You yourself are begetting yourself. You are bringing yourself out. And by the self-limitation, you will bring yourself out. And you make the eye. You must first make the eye. The apple of your eye. And when you see that to reflect you, then you know who you are. Because you had to forget who you are to become what you are. And being in the form of man, he now has completely forgotten that he ever was other than man. So here is a presence was once in the form of the infinite being called God. And he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a slave and was made in the likeness of man and became obedient unto death, even death upon the cross of man. And having done that, he has completely forgotten the rock that he really is, for he is the rock. He is this eternal rock, this created rock. But as we begin to expand, begin to awake, all of the imagery of scripture comes back. And so I didn't sit down to conscious of it. I hadn't the slightest idea when I sat in my home that day, with my eyes closed, and my attention turned inward, into my star, that that rock would appear. I certainly didn't conjure it. And suddenly before my eyes comes the rock, this enormous quartz, and then fragmented, assembled into a human form, seated in the lotus posture, in profound meditation. And as I looked at it, I am looking at the image of myself, for I saw in that eye, the apple of my eye, I saw myself. And from this rock, I form the being that is my image, and work upon it until it becomes luminous, becomes real, when it becomes completely alive, so I can endow it with myself. For you're told the rock, his work is perfect. And be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And in the same chapter we are told, is he not your father who created you? He who made you and established you, is he not your father? And then the question is asked, what is his name? Whose name? The one who established all the ends of the earth. What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you have. For the minute the second question is asked, you get the answer of the first. What is his name? 
And what is his son's name? Well, many I say, what is his son's name? I know at least he is father. If he has a son, then the first question asked of him, that answer, he's a father. I mean, I call him Mr. Brown, Mr. John, Mr. something. At least he's father, if you ask me what is his son's name. So here I'm begetting a son. In my image. The perfect image of myself. That I make best. And I use everything in this world to further my will, to create my image. If God's will for man is advanced even through the cold surgery of war, he takes war, takes convulsions, takes everything to advance his will to fulfill his purpose, which is let us make man in our image. But I can't make man in my image until I know my image. I must first know my image. And my image is reflected only in the pupil of the eye. And so here, the apple of his eye, which is the pupil of the eye, that most precious part of the eye. And the word apple means literally the little man. And so you look into the eye, and see yourself in miniature, this tiny little thing. So in the book of Amos, he asked the question, because he found Jacob, and he asked the question, how can Jacob stand? He is so small. This tiny little thing, the limit of contraction. And then, having reached the limit of contraction, then he begins to expand. And he expands it beyond the wildest dream of man. For God took upon himself the limit of contraction for the purpose of expansion. There is no limit to expansion, no limit to translucency, only a limit to contraction and a limit to opacity, but not to its opposite. So he made himself a limit, and by assuming the limit, he achieves his wonderful limitless purposes, his desires. Now, on this level, we can prove it. That is on the mystical level. I share with you my experience with the rock. The story that I told you last year with you, Carl Jung, when he was in a deep state of depression. He had a heart attack, a broken leg, he was in an oxygen tent, and the despair of his life. And he found himself in some strange, wonderful land, moving towards a little wayside chapel. And here is, the door was ajar. So he walked into the little chapel, walked up to the altar, and to his surprise, it looked like a Christian church, but it had no crucifix and no image of the Blessed Virgin. And so he wanted to fly. But in the place of these two, that you usually find in Christian churches, there were beautiful flowers, which he preferred. Lovely flowers all around the altar. To him that was a far better thing to have than these little things on the wall. And looking down, he noticed a figure seated in the lotus posture. And looking closer, he recognized himself. He himself was seated in the lotus posture. And then he became a little bit disturbed, in fact, a little bit afraid, and said he to himself, Aha, so it is you who is meditating me. And I know when you awake, I will no longer be. Well, I wouldn't say he is meditating you, or you meditating him. It's one. In the end, there will only be the one. He is actually spending himself by this act of creation. There will not be two, just one. There will be no such thing as you, just me. And I will know I did it for a purpose. And yet I didn't bring this being into this world to rob him of individuality. We are one. A complete fusion, a complete absorption takes place. 
But on this level, let us show you how we you work it in the most practical manner. I don't have to look in the pupil of your eye to get what I'm looking for. When I know what I want, I can start to see using you without your knowledge, without your consent. I bring others into a scene. I may listen, eavesdrop upon a conversation taking place which I am controlling. I hear you discuss my good fortune, or the good fortune is the one who I want to help. And so when I see the whole thing in my mind's eye clearly, I know the potency of this picture is in its implication. What is it implying? Not the words, not your face, not the handshake, not this, but it is implying something. And its creative power is in its implication. So all of a sudden I hear you say to someone else, have you heard the good news about, and I'm listening carefully, and then they say, yes, I've heard it. And then I listen to the conversation. I am seeing it all in my mind's eye. Then we understand why in Scripture, the 40th chapter of Psalm, he has bored an ear for me. We think we have ears, but we don't hear. For we only hear the outer sound. And he has bored an ear for me. And he thanks him for boring the air. It allows him to hear these inaudible sounds. These things that only you alone can hear. So you construct a theme, implying the fulfillment of your dream, which, as you construct it, may use the medium of sound. And so you listen to the voice of those present. And you hear it because you are imagining that they're saying exactly what you want to hear. And when you hear it, the potency of that picture is what it is implied. And await in the not distant future what it implies you will realize. Just as God, looking into my eye, which he first had to make that could reflect him, and the God who was doing it was my very own being. There's only God. And so you made this form and made it sensitive to reflect what he looks like. And when he knows exactly what he looks like, then he can make me in his image. So the rock, his work is perfect. And that was the rock. His work is perfect. Prior to that moment, I had forgotten the rock that began me. I was unmindful of it. Unmindful of the God who gave me birth. And then it happened. And I saw the reason behind this strange, peculiar symbolism, this imagery of scripture. So we are warned, do not change it. If I should take the word rock out of the Bible in that chapter, because it offends. In this little simple verse, for instance, they came to the man and they said, Where are you staying? And he said, come and see. And they came with him and they remained with him because it was the tenth hour. The most modern translation of scripture called the English Bible. The new English Bible. This is the most modern translation. This is what they say of that passage. They came and they stayed with him because it was 4 p.m. All the difference in the world. Yes, if you start at 6 in the morning and you have a measured stay, and the day begins at 6 in the Hebraic world, it does. Well, you add 10 hours to 6, it would be 4 p.m. But you aren't going to get the meaning behind 4 p.m. as against the word him. And they came to him and they said, Where are you staying? Come and see. So they followed him. And following him, they remained with him because it was the king hour. But king is the numerical value of the hand. The first letter in the name of God. Yod, a sin. Yod, hey, bow, hey. 
And ten means the creative power. The power to create became the soul, the secret of creation. So they remain with it. This is a power that creates it. But if you're going to translate it and give it sense, what does Kofia mean? Has nothing to do with the great mystery. So they came to his place and they found where he was staying. Oh, where am I staying? Where are you staying? That state to which we must constantly return constitutes our dwelling place. You can lift me under my wall right now with a joke, and then one second later, I go back into my depression. Pull me out again, go back into my depression. So the state to which I must constantly return, that constitutes where I am staying. And where was it staying? In the ten hour. Always creating. Not 4 p.m. Has nothing to do with any 4 p.m. So the minute we tamper with God's great word, by changing it to make it, to give it sense, I might just as well take the word rock out of the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy to give it sense. Because how can a rock become a person? The rock, his work is perfect. He faced the rock with God. Wait, the day will come and suddenly you too will be in the silence. And then something will happen as you turn your attention inward. And then the rock will appear before you. It will fragment. And when it reassembles into the human form, you're going to see yourself. And you're going to see exactly what you saw when you looked in to the eye of Jacob. That state of consciousness called the little one. For when you see into the pupil of the eye, you always see yourself. You never see another. And you see yourself in miniature. Now you know exactly what you look like. So you take the rock and you break it. And then you reshape it and make it conform to what you saw. And it's yourself. You can't see another. God cannot see another. There is no other. That great Shema, the confession of faith of the Hebrew world. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Here is a compound unit, but in our language, Hear, O Israel, the I Am, our I Am, is one I Am. So in the end, one I Am. And this one I am, contracting itself, sees multitude. Expanding itself, it sees one. The day will come, you will see it. You will see this one man containing all. And as you contract, your limitless senses is fragmented into numberless nations and races and people. But then, as you expand the senses, it becomes one. So here, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. So tonight, you take it on this level. Because the other you can't invoke. It just happens. It happens as the automatic growth and expansion of consciousness. I certainly did not sit down in the hope of ever seeing a rock. It never occurred to me when I sat that day in my apartment that in the silence I would see anything. I didn't seek anything. I simply saw the light, which is an automatic reaction when you withdraw from the outer world. It's golden liquid light and it pulses all through your head. And it goes off like smoke ring. And you can control it. You can let it go off like a funnel. Or stop it. A ring after ring after ring. If you don't stop it, it forms one solid funnel. But you can stop it and you can disperse it. And it's just a joy doing it. That's all I intended to do. When suddenly, the cross appeared. And then, shattered. I saw no hand. No creative hand to mold it. But it was molded into a living form. A pulsing living form. Not some little statue. And then I look at it, I'm looking at myself. So I first had to see Jacob. I know him to be the apple of my eye. If I couldn't find the apple of my eye, 
I wouldn't know what I looked like. For God couldn't see himself, that he sees himself reflected in the pupil of the eye of man. So he has to make the pupil. He has to make it like a mirror, like a reflection. And then he takes one good look and he sees exactly what he looks like. Then he starts the work upon man. So tonight, if you have an objective for anyone in this world, don't ask anyone if it's possible. You want it? That's good enough. Don't ask the individual. Say you ask this much of yourself. Is it a loving thing? What I want it for myself, were I in that position? If you can answer in the affirmative, yes, well then it's right. Whenever you exercise your imagination lovingly on behalf of another, you're literally mediating God to that other. So don't ask anyone if it is right. It's always right if it is done in love. So you bring before your mind's eye a scene, a simple scene. And may I tell you, if you tell it to others, they may criticize you for it, and they will say, well, was that a loving thing? Well, it's their privilege. Was that the loving thing? Like someone looking at a building and reading a title, which title is true, would imply ownership by the one who beholds it. And yet it wasn't his building. All right, I wouldn't criticize the one. He looked and he saw his own name on the marquee. And in a not distant future, that building was for sale. And he had no money. And a total stranger became the means through which he owned it that day. Paid off the man in full and owned it 100%. Got it for, in those days, $50,000 was an awful lot of money. He had 50,000 pennies. 50,000 pennies would be a tremendous sum for him in that day. That day being 1924. He paid it off, and last year, that man sold the building, not the business, only the building. He consolidated his business with a far bigger business, but the building he could be sold for eight hundred and forty thousand dollars. He bought it in twenty-four for fifty and sold it last year for eight hundred and forty. And there was no capital gain in the area where he resided. Almost, as you can see, almost eight hundred thousand dollars net in simply using his imagination. Others would say, was it right? He justifies it. He felt it was his father's. And he felt in his heart his father was robbed of it by two or more who profited a plan to take it from him. And they did for two years. And this one simply, how he knew the law, I don't know. He simply knew the law and began to apply it. And so vividly in his mind's eye, the name, which was his own name, his family name, and simply saw it. And every day, twice a day, on his way to work and from work, he stopped and saw that name. And then two years later, the building was for sale. And a total stranger came in, asked me if he wanted to buy it. He said, I have no money. But I'll buy it for you. You give me 6% on whatever I have to pay for it. Reduce my principal in 10 years. Every year you reduce it and pay me 6% on the balance left of the business, which he did. At the end of 10 years, the man was paid off. And not once did he ever fail to receive his interest on his 50000 Then he said to this man, would you take the money back into the business? Because it's a far better investment there. So I can't give you 6% on this money. I can buy money cheaper than 6%. All right, give me four. He took it in. And when that man died about 15 years ago, he left this one who had the vision. $150,000 in cash. 
as a friend of his who really was his best friend, said. And yet they were not friends when this thing started. This is how this principle works. The power was in what the name implied. If I see a marquee and it bears my name in full, there may be another one bearing my name in this world. But if I am looking at it, I feel that's my name and it means it's mine. But well, what does it imply? I am the owner. See it. And in a way that I do not know, the power is in its implication. That's the power. And it comes that way. So God looked into your eye and he saw himself. The apple of his eye. So he inserted he cared for you and kept you as the apple of his eye and brought you out of the desert, this wild wilderness. And then finally, he fused with you, fell in love with his own image. And the two became one, so there will not be two gods, only one God. There can't be two gods. So in the end, you don't lose. You simply are one with your father who created you, and you are the father. And he proved to you that you are a father because he set it up in the beginning how he's going to prove it. He set it up by naming a son. And this son is God's only begotten son. And he sets him up in the beginning. So when he takes his image that is in his own eye, perfect, he has now to reveal his fatherhood, and the Son reveals it for him. The Son of God comes into your presence. You are now one with God, and you see God's only begotten Son, but he doesn't look over your shoulder and call another one God. Or father. He looks at you, and he calls you Father, and you know you are this. That's how he reveals this union of the image and himself. So you're not an image anymore, you are God. So this is the apple of his eye. That everyone in this world is being formed until that eye can really reflect the creator. And when it reflects the creator, then he inserts, cares for him, and calls him and keeps it, the apple of his eye. Until that moment in time, he can actually produce the perfect image of himself and then absorb the image. And he and the image are one. And whatever he was before absorption, the image which is now one with God has to experience. So if he was a father, now I am a father. So in this 30 second chapter, the word father is used with the rod. Is he not the Father who created me? Is he not my begetter who created me? But he used the word Father. And so, in this wonderful book called the Bible, we have all the beautiful uh, symbolism and imagery that men and women, as they begin to unfold, find unfolding within themselves. Don't teach it. Don't turn from one little state, like what we told you a few minutes ago, from it was 10 to 4 p.m. It was the 10th hour. All the difference in the world. As we are told, he went forward into the world. And he was told to go into a strange land. And then he would be enslaved for 400 years. And you think it means 400 years? No, as long as I wear this body, and I don't really drop this body when men call me dead, I am instantly restored to life in a body that is just as real as this, until the very end of my journey, and that journey isn't 400 years. Scripture measures it as 6,000 years. But 400 had to be used. 600 or 6,000 would not have conveyed the meaning. For every letter in the Hebrew world has a numerical as well as a symbolical value. 
So when Abraham was sold, he would be enslaved for 400 years. Then he'd be brought out and given the promise. 400 is the 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Its symbol is that of a cross. And this is the cross. He was 100 years old when this child was born. Not 100 years old, as we, you and I would measure time. But 100 is the numerical value of the 19th letter, Ko. And Ko has the symbolical value of the back of the skull. And that's where the drama takes place. It's all here in the skull. So this is the rock of which we are unmindful. Completely unmindful of this rock. So they put him into a tomb that was hewn out of a rock. What rock? This rock. And that's where he sleeps and dreams the dream of life. He dreams it for his 6,000 years. At the end of the dream, his image is complete. He fuses with the image, and they are two, they are one. Then you will know the mystery of that second chapter of Genesis, where man, who is God, God is man. So he becomes man, and then he comes an emanation. The emanation is his image. She comes out of him. So you read the words, my emanation, yet my wife, till the sleep of death is past. And so my emanation comes out. It is my wife, my image. But in the end, I must leave everything and cleave to my wife until we become one. For the wife is not flesh and blood. The wife is the image that I saw in the apple of my eye. Here is the apple of my eye. And I saw my emanation, my reflection, and fell in love with it. And it took me 6,000 years torture, mingled with some lovely things, but much of it torture, to actually leave it into something alive that I could be one with it. And then in the end we become one being, not two. So tonight, on this level, you try it. Try it with a friend. And see if it's not in the not distant future. It works and proves itself in performance. It will. And don't be disturbed when others are disturbed. Don't be disturbed. It doesn't really matter. He is working on us to mold his eye so he can see his perfect reflection before he can start the work. Now it's just about time for a silence, and then we'll have the question. No other questions, please. Yes, sir. No. No, I was simply sitting as you are now, with my eyes shut, my attention turned on the inside, into my skull, and just wait, and just a matter of seconds, your all these dark convolutions of the brain grow luminous, become golden, and this, you're surrounded with golden liquid light. I did not anticipate anything, I didn't think of anything, I simply enjoyed doing it. And then came this uh, course before my vision. But I do not do anything physically to induce it. No physical lotus posture. I saw the image in the lotus posture, but I was not. First of all, it would be to me a most uncomfortable position. I wasn't trained to sit that way. And so I sit as the wrestler sits on a chair. Quite often I recline on a couch. But whatever to me is the most comfortable, so I'm not called by the pressure of the body. That to me is the way to do it. Any other questions? And 
The memory is with you forever, but you don't walk into light. In the sense that you are aware of it, you come down to the world of Caesar. Let us remain on the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, no, we must go down into the cities and the villages. So you don't remain up. But you do have a memory of what happened. And it's with you forever as far as the memory goes. For any time. Anyone here could sit quietly, turn their attention inwardly, no try to force it, and then in a little while you find the light coming. It comes automatically. The rock was something like this. Huge, solid quartz. And I didn't know that would happen. I just simply looked at it. And it broke. <laughs> Fragmented. And then quickly reassembled. <laughs> Pardon me. What hands did it? I don't know. I only know it took the human form. Seated in a lotus posture. And then I saw it. Myself. In the area of the heart, well, as far as I'm concerned, I've never had that. All of mine has been right in the tomb. The whole drama seems to me to unfold in the tomb, which is the skull, the sepulchre. This is Golgotha, and the drama begins and ends. In Golgotha, in the beginning, God, in a tomb in Egypt. And this is Egypt. He found Jacob in the desert, which is Egypt. And there he encircled him, he cared for him, and kept him as the apple of his eye. So you find him here. I have never had anything here with my solar plexus, or heart, or any part of my trunk. Always in the head. <laughs> well, the word heart and mind in Hebrew are the same. But we do use the word heart as a feeling. And yet, really, it isn't a feeling organ at all. It doesn't have the sensation that we endow it. We use the word core, the heart of a person, the heartfelt handshake. But really, the heart as an organ is a muscle. It has the sensitivity that the world thinks. Yet it is the very organ that pumps blood all through the system to keep it alive. But as far as I am concerned, I can only share with you what I have experienced. I have not experienced it outside of my head. That's where I experience it. It's all here, all in my skull. But I would not go out and say that because I had it this way, that is the only way. I'm not going to say that. Only I relate what I have experienced with Scripture. And when he's buried, it's very rare. Golgotha. When they come to find him, where do they go? Golgotha. What do they discover? Stone rolled away. And they say he's risen. He's not here. So you come out of the skull. I know there are many, many books in the world that are written on speculation, not written on experience. And I confine my platform to experience. But I know there are numbered books where men and women have sat down to work out what they consider a workable philosophy of life. Well, the evangelists were not. They were not in any way describing events of the past as historians. What they were really doing, they were determined to pass on the message of salvation as preachers who themselves experienced salvation. And they experienced it in the way of the skull. So they're totally in the skull. And the four evangelists mention only the skull. They don't mention the other part. 
that I can't find in any part of the scripture for the other parts to mention say in a metaphorical sense you will mention the art but when they are describing the actual situation, the event they come right down to the rock and speak of the rock as the tomb, the tomb as the sepulchre sepulchre as Golgotha and then Luke comes right out and spells it right out in big bold type the skull so I have to go along with what I have experienced but I know there are so many schools of thought in the world where men got together and thought, no, this is what it ought to be. And they write textbooks on what it ought to be. And then they teach and graduate people in a certain ism. For that's not vision. Mine is vision 100%. I'm not speculating. Yes, no, no, you do it all in your imagination. When you've done it so that the imaginal thought takes on tones of reality, and you break the spell by opening your eyes, you will become fair. You will move under compulsion across a series of events leading up to the fulfillment of what you've imagined. What when you think you were being at all and you are imagining yourself in a particular chair, and then go from imagining to well, a friend of mine told me last Sunday, see the previous lecture night, which was on Friday, I suggested a certain little exercise, which I find very uh, helpful. I would sit in a certain portion of my room, my apartment. And imagine myself elsewhere in my apartment where I cannot see with my physical eye. And so then I would sit, stay in my living room, imagine myself at the telephone down the hallway. I can't see the place in the living room from the hallway or the hallway from the living room. And then I go back and forth. And if I'm at the telephone, <laughs> when physically I'm at the uh, living room. When I open my eyes, it's with a shock. It seems so real to me that I should be where I'm imagining. So I open my eyes on a shock. But, as he said, I did it and it was fun. Do you know what happened? <coughs> he said I had to go and sit where I had imagined I was. He went right over and sat down and only realized after he sat, well, this is what he was doing. Moved under compulsion to fulfill what he had done. Try it. Try it and see how it works. Several years ago, I recall her daughter and her daughter. Yes. She was born in England. That she didn't tell me. She loves her daughter. The daughter lives in England. Her husband is English. The mother is English, but she became an American subject, citizen. And so she simply desired to see her daughter. And as soon as she was looking at the daughter, when the daughter came in and started fixing something in the mantelpiece, and then turned around and saw her, <laughs> and they both saw each other, and both were equally startled, and it broke the spell. But the daughter wrote and confirmed it. I've done it in number of times. Anyone. I say man is all imagination. Therefore, man must be wherever he is in imagination. You look at a man, and you think, well, no, he's there. Is he really there? 
He could be plotting the most horrible thing in the world, and you see him sitting in a pew in church. Is he really there? He is plotting and planning something. So he is where he is plotting and planning. Well, time is up. Until tomorrow. Thank you.